if at first you don't succeed, try, try again. My parents told me that, and millions of other parents told their children that, and someone must have told Italian Army Chief of Staff Luigi Cadorna that, because this week he launched the 11th Battle of the Isonzo River. I'm Indy Nidell. Welcome to The Great War. Last week, there was action in the West in both Belgium and France, with Canadian success in the latter. Both sides made gains in Romania. There was growing chaos and violence at home in Russia, and the Italian front grew ready to explode once again. And that explosion happened this week. The Italians launched the battle August 18th, and would, within the week, capture five mountain peaks and 20,000 enemy prisoners. The opening barrage went off before sunrise the 18th and over 5,000 guns spent the day blasting the Austrian positions. The barrage was most effective on the section of the front commanded by Lieutenant General Enrico Caviglia, who had spotted all the Austrian positions in his sector. Every one opposite his lines was now either destroyed or badly damaged. As the barrage drew to its close, the Italians attacked along the entire front from the Tolmino bridgehead to the Adriatic Sea. Caviglia's 24th Corps began crossing the Isonzo, and though the 60th Division faced heavy fire and stiff resistance well into the night, the 47th Division, facing the already weakened Czech rifles, quickly crossed the river and went up the opposite bank. By dawn the 19th, they had secured the river and set up pontoon bridges, and Italians began pouring across. On the rest of the line, the Austro-Hungarian resistance was successful, and both sides took heavy casualties. On the southern edge of the Bainsitza Plateau, the Italians tried repeatedly to take Mount Santo, but to no avail, and the battle along most of the line became a deadly war of attrition. Still, by the morning of the 20th, Caviglia had surrounded the Czech rifles and torn a gap in the Austrian lines at the northern end of the plateau, and the path to possible victory was open. But General Luigi Capello, in overall command of the Second Army, was unwilling to move his army forward on such a narrow front while the Austrians held positions on its flanks. Cadorna agreed with him. Thing is, as John MacDonald points out in Caporetto and the Isonzo campaign, neither general seemed able to comprehend the fact that the enemy on the flanks were in static fortifications and thus in no position to intervene in a fluid battle behind them. After two days of hesitation, the opportunity was lost. The Duke of Aosta, leading the Third Army, was attacking on the Carso Plateau, but his attacks on the northern and southern flanks were unsuccessful. He used a massive artillery barrage, supported by Navy guns at sea and British artillery batteries, but could not force the Austrian positions. The Austrians even took 6,000 Italian prisoners from the flanks of the Duke's army, which says something about Italian morale by this point. It was a different story, though, with the Duke's center. By the 19th, Austrian General Svetosar Baroyevich von Boigne's attention had been drawn to Caviglia's success on the Bainsitza Plateau, as he believed the Carso would hold. But in the center, the Duke's artillery had broken and scattered the defenders. The Duke hesitated in sending in the infantry, though, and by the time he attacked, the Austrian defenders had regrouped. But the Italian advantage in men and artillery would tell over time. By the 22nd, new gaps were being torn in the Austrian lines, though not being exploited, and Borojevich was convinced he had to abandon the Bainsitza Plateau. That night, he removed his men to new defensive lines further back, and when morning arrived, the Italians prepared to renew the attack, only to find the enemy gone. But the Austrians had lost the Bainsitza Plateau and Mount Santo. However, McDonald claims that the Italians had lost more this week. He thinks they lost their greatest opportunity of the war, their greatest chance to win it. Now, I can't say whether he's right or not, but opportunity there certainly was. Another Allied offensive also began this week. On the 20th, the second offensive battle of Verdun began. The French took enemy defenses north of Verdun on a 17-kilometer front to a depth of nearly 3 kilometers and now hold Avocourt, the Mortom, and Hill 240, taking 5,000 German prisoners. On the 24th, they advanced again, carrying Hill 304. Many of you may remember these names. They were the scenes of some of the bloodiest fighting in history during the Battle of Verdun last year. Now, this was a diversionary attack aimed at preventing the Germans from sending troops up to the huge Allied offensive at Ypres. There was another such diversionary attack still in progress, the Battle of Hill 70. 
the Canadian Corps took the high ground early in the week and resisted nearly two dozen German counterattacks, though Canadian attacks on the city itself were unsuccessful and it remained in German hands. But those German counterattacks had terrible casualties for the Germans, and total casualties for the battle were around 9,000 for the Canadians, but some 25,000 for the Germans. And what of that offensive at Ypres? Well, the initial gains of the battle were not being maintained, though on August 22nd, a few hundred meters on the Menin Road were gained for 3,000 casualties. But this was really a triumph for the Germans, again stopping a numerically superior sustained attack. For the three and a half weeks of advance and counterattack, British Commander-in-Chief Sir Douglas Haig's men had advanced about three kilometers, which was a little more than half of the first day's objective. His amphibious attack force was still just there waiting for the fall of Rulez. It was pretty much clear that Rulez was in no danger of being captured though, and that force would quietly be disbanded. The offensive focus of the battle would now shift away from Hugh Goff's 5th Army to Herbert Plumer's 2nd Army. Haig gave Plumer three weeks to prepare for his attacks. Plumer had been there for two years and unlike Haig or Goff, had been paying attention to the new German defense system and had come up with a counter tactic for the Hindenburg Line's flexible defense system. Haig had more reason for confidence than he knew. Plumer had, in fact, found the key to the German defense, one that neutralized its strengths and exploited its inherent weaknesses. Like most truly brilliant military plans, Plumer's was elegant in its simplicity. It began with the premise that relatively short gains, gains of a mile or less, had become available almost for the asking as a result of the thinness and elasticity of the German forward positions. Premise number two was that gains of several miles were now more out of the question than ever because of the Germans' increased ability to counterattack in force. The conclusion was so blindingly obvious that only Plumer and his staff had seen it. What Plumer planned to do was to outsmart the Germans with attacks that stopped when they took the easy ground and never went far enough to trigger a counterattack. If he did a cumulative series of such attacks, it might drive the Germans back out of their defenses and maybe into a war of maneuver that they didn't have the manpower to survive. There was actually a war of movement that the Germans were currently fighting in Romania, though the movement was coming to an end. On August 19th, Romanian military command took over complete control of running the ongoing Battle of Marasheshti from the Russians. The fighting was fairly intense at this point, but Romania held its ground. Though there would be some more scattered action after this week, the Germans would be unable to improve their positions, and the Romanian lines would hold. This battle will end as a Romanian success, which is a testament to their army's reorganization and retraining this spring after being beaten last fall by the combined Central Powers. The Romanians and their allies, the Russians, took around 25,000 casualties each, while the Germans took over 60,000. I do not have figures for the Austro-Hungarian casualties. The Russians had been pulled out there to try to save their own front, where the Germans claimed 22,000 Russian prisoners in recent fighting in Galicia and Bukovina. The Germans were now going into action in the far north, beginning attacks towards Riga on the 21st. The following day, the Russian defenders retreated 12 kilometers to shorten the front lines and try to prevent disaster. But disaster came at the beginning of the week, far to the south, behind the Allied lines. On the 18th, the Great Fire of Salonika broke out. Almost half of the city burned down and 80,000 people were made homeless. British Army headquarters was destroyed, and more importantly, almost all of the stock of quinine, which was needed to treat the epidemic levels of malaria in the region. And the week ends. With Germans unable to advance in Romania, the British unable to advance in Belgium, but French and Canadian success in France, and a huge new offensive in Italy. That could have possibly won the war, at least according to some historians. But this isn't the first such possible opportunity. The Brusilov Offensive, the fall of Gorizia, there were big opportunities there and maybe other places that were not taken advantage of. But can you really blame the various leaders for that? I mean, the war has gone on for so long, with the monotony of endless carnage failing to produce victory, that when the chance for it comes, do you really think you'd see it? Maybe not. If you want to learn more about Luigi Cadorna, the father of 11 battles of the Asanzo River so far, you can click right here for our episode about him. Our Patreon supporter of the week is Matthew Benson. Help us out on Patreon to make this show better and better and you'll get cool perks in return. Don't forget to subscribe. See you next time.